Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crowley. I'm back with another video. This is number 33 in my ongoing series of videos on storytelling, creating comics, uh, inventing characters, all that good stuff. I've put it together in a single playlist and there is a link to it in the description of this video. But let's get on with this one. I'm working on a drawing here today uh, of Moana and uh, it uh, will come up as an example later on as we get into the uh, topic today, which is uh, story beginnings. I did a video a few months back on story endings and uh, for some reason <laughs> I did the endings one first and the, I'm doing the beginning one uh, today. Just shows you how good I am at planning these things out. Um, but I've got uh, 12 different pieces of advice on uh, um, uh, creating the, the beginning of your story. And uh, let's go ahead and crack on with the first one here. Number one. Most stories uh, begin by showing the reader two things. One, here's what ordinary life has been like for a long time. Two, today something different happened. And uh, I do believe that the vast majority of uh, stories follow that pattern. You know, uh, people don't write a story about the day that nothing happened. I suppose some do. Uh, but mostly we want to write about uh, an event that's interesting and, or exciting or dramatic in some way. And that means that we kind of have to set the stage by showing you what life was like before the unusual thing happened. If we just uh, throw you right into the unusual uh, thing, we don't have the contrast. Um, we don't understand what makes this unusual. We kind of have to see what ordinary life was like first. And uh, as you look back through lots of different uh, movies and stories you've read, I think you'll find that uh, the vast majority of them follow that pattern. So think of those two things. Uh, showing ordinary life and then uh, the real meat of the story begins when we start getting into the day that something different happened. Number two here. The opening scenes are often about giving the reader all the info they need uh, to understand slash enjoy the real story. Um, this is uh, this is something where we start to get into the aspect of exposition. You're giving information uh, to the readers. They uh, can't really follow uh, along. Sometimes you can't really get into the meat of the story until you've um, just sort of got people up to speed with certain key facts uh, that make your story comprehensible. Um, and I put in quotations here the real story. Of course, the beginning of your story is also part of the real story, but there, there's this sort of feeling um, that we get when the real adventure begins, and it usually is somewhere in that point where today something different happened. And you see the person, the main character, if you have one, getting pulled into some unusual uh, circumstance. Um, so uh, that's something to think about, the, the fact that you've You've got to devote some time to getting information to the reader, and that means you need to think as a, uh, as a writer, as a storyteller, what do they need to know before we get going? You know, a simple, straightforward story requires very little exposition, um, but uh, a more complex story may have a whole series of uh, bits of information that you need to get across. And um, that can get you into a, a tricky place where you're like, boy, I need my reader to know so much stuff, but I don't want to just sit here doing scene after scene that's explaining stuff to the reader. And uh, we're going get, to get to that uh, in the very next uh, piece of advice here. Number three, all this info can be supplied by way of genuine storytelling scenes or through direct exposition. Prolonged exposition is generally less fun for the reader than real storytelling. Now, uh, I don't want to assume that everyone knows what the word exposition means, but it basically is where you are telling something directly to uh, the viewer, uh, the reader. And uh, I think a good example is maybe at the beginning of Ratatouille. I hope everyone has seen that movie. It's a great one if you haven't. Uh, and uh, in Ratatouille... Uh, at the very beginning, you'll remember that there's this freeze frame as uh, Remy is crashing through a window with a cookbook on top of his head, the little rat main character. And uh, it freeze frames and he says, this is me. Now that whole thing where he starts saying, this is me, that's exposition. There's no getting around it. Uh, Remy is speaking to us, the people <laughs> in the movie theater, basically. Uh, and I think that even Brad Bird, you know, who directed that movie, might say, well, it's a sort of a necessary evil. We've got a, we've got an unusual 
concept here, a rat who who is able to uh, cook, you know, or has, is fascinated with cooking. We need to set that up. And he could have done it in scenes. Uh, if it was a three or four hour movie, <laughs> he could have done a bunch of scenes in which we come to understand uh, how Remy first discovered that he has this uh, amazing talent, you know. Uh, but uh, clearly they thought, no, we don't have time for that. We need to just sort of get this info. You might even call it like an info dump. You know, we just have to get some of this info into the brains of the audience, uh, the people watching, so that we can move on to the good stuff. Uh, the real story. So as I said, you've got a choice there between uh, telling it by way of scenes or showing it by way of scenes uh, and uh, doing it that way or direct exposition. Prolonged exposition is, is frowned upon and when you go on and on and on telling people stuff instead of showing it to them, um, you know, it's like I said, it's less fun uh, and it also sort of doesn't allow the viewer to engage in the process. Sometimes it's better to let them figure it out. They don't want to be told everything. They want to be shown things that allow uh, them to figure it out on their own. There are a lot of exceptions to this though. Sorry that I'm going on for such a long time, but there certain people can get away with uh, with exposition when it's really interesting exposition or it's a sort of a stylistic choice, but it, they know that they're doing it. Uh, it's not a weak thing that they're doing. They're they're making a deliberate choice, and um, you know I wonder if like there are like Wes Anderson films, and uh, I think the series of unfortunate events is one where the narrator is like right there telling you stuff, but the narrator is almost like a character in the story. And uh, anyway, that is the exception to the rule. I I don't want people to think that uh, all exposition is wrong, and you must never do that. Uh, but if you are engaging in prolonged exposition, you really need to be good at it. You need to know what you're doing. Let's move on now to number four. Uh, you can avoid prolonged exposition at the beginning by shifting it to a point later on in the form of a backstory dialogue scene. Now, uh, Moana here kind of comes into play. There's, um, there's a point where uh, the grandmother leads her into this cave and uh, she starts to have these visions of what the you know uh, the people on the island what they used to be like in the past. I would argue that that is all exposition, and that they thought you know let's not just put this at the beginning in a sort of a once upon a time sequence, but let's uh, shift it a little later on to this part where the um, you know the grandma and the sort of ghosts of the island past can. Uh, bring us a, a little more, you know, there's a lot, again, with Moana, there's a lot of info that we got to get to the viewer before the story gets underway, and you can see them sort of struggling to get that info in there. Uh, speaking of exposition, um, one movie that really does it well is uh, Wreck-It Ralph, I think. Wreck-It Ralph begins with uh, Ralph is seemingly talking to us, the people in the audience, telling us about, you know, about his game and who he is and all this stuff. And then eventually we come to realize that he's at this sort of Alcoholics Anonymous, except it's for bad guys anonymous, a support group for bad guys in video games. And I thought that was you know, pretty clever how they did that. They take all this stuff that seems like exposition and then they sort of pull the camera back and you're like, oh, okay, he's sort of introducing himself to the other guys. It's, a, I think, a pretty elegant way of, of getting that stuff in there. So you may want to explore uh, possibilities like that where um, instead of just talking directly to the reader, maybe you uh, get it in in some more elegant way as they did in uh, Wreck-It Ralph. Let's move on now to... Number five, if your story focuses on a single main character, you probably need at least one early scene that helps readers know who they are, what they want, etc. Um, this is certainly true of, uh, of Moana. We get a sense of uh, how she really would love to get out uh, on the boats and uh, have an adventure out on the open sea. Um, they give us really plenty of um, scenes at the beginning to help us understand that character to help us care about them because that, that we can't really care about them no matter how exciting all the action sequences are later on. We can't really care about them unless we know who they are. We have some sense uh, of who they are. And um, uh, I guess I can uh, use as a quick example my own uh, 
uh, story Brody's ghost. Uh, hang on a second, I'll show you a, a bit of explaining who Brody is. So here's Brody's ghost. It begins with actually a scene that has no exposition at all, where he wakes up in the morning and it's all visual storytelling. We get some sense of how messy he is, but we don't really know who he is. We don't know much of his backstory at all. And basically what I did is I shifted, as I talked about here, I, I uh, shifted it to later on in the story when Brody sits down and talks to his uh, friend Gabe. And during uh, this conversation, we get to the uh, a pretty crucial piece of information about how Brody uh, split up with his girlfriend, Nicole. And uh, that's what this is all about. We want uh, the reader to know who Brody is, what he has suffered through in terms of this breakup uh, with a, 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 his uh, girlfriend and how, you know, this makes you f feel connected to him and you feel bad for him. Um, pretty much a requirement, I would say, in any story that focuses on a main character. We need at least one scene where we get to know that character a little bit better. So uh, if you're, you know, if you've got uh, a main character uh, and you've got all these incredible adventures planned, take a moment at the beginning to help us care about them. Uh, and indeed, it sort of weaves into what I was saying earlier about ordinary life. You know, these two things go together. Uh, we got to see what ordinary life was like before the extraordinary events began to take place. Um, even just briefly, like uh, Luke Skywalker in the first Star, Star Wars movie. We just see a little bit of him and how bored he is. And, he, and we got that one conversation with the uh, Aunt Beru and Uncle Owen. That's all we need. We just need to get some sense. Who's this guy? What does he want? Then we can care when all the incredible adventures begin. Now, let's move on to number six here. Uh, if your story involves a lot of world building, your early scenes should help readers understand what it feels like to live in this world, what its rules are, etc. Don't get carried away, though. Eventually, the reader needs you to get on with the real story. Um, and so, yeah, there's the, in, I would say, especially in uh, world building, where you've, you've invented this whole new world that people are experiencing and being brought into, you are, um, you have this responsibility to help readers understand what this world is like. And, um, but you got to be careful because it can be tempting to go on and on about introducing the rules of the world and how amazing this world is that you've created. At some point, the reader wants you to just get on with the story. Um, so it's sort of like, yeah, you don't want to have too little or too much uh, when it comes to the world, world building stuff. And in a lot of ways, I think you could just sort of toss somebody in and they will begin to figure out the world uh, of your story as you go along. So you don't necessarily have to have back-to-back -back a whole bunch of sequences right at the beginning uh, that are introducing the world. What I did in Brody's Ghost, sorry to bring this back again, is but I, I put in a lot of uh, things that sort of visually introduced us to this world, starting with this big opening spread. And then I put in a lot of pages that are just helping us have a sense of what it feels like to be in this futuristic uh, decaying cityscape. So that was my strategy in terms of world building, maybe just visual world building, uh, before we start to get on with the quote-unquote real story. Um, so, we, uh, I guess I've said enough about that. Let's move on to number seven. Some stories have a beginning before the beginning. That should have said the beginning. Sorry, that beginning? <laughs> A beginning before the beginning, a scene or brief sequence that is separate in time or space from the main story. It's very common to have these sort of book-ending sequences uh, in the movie Titanic. If you ever saw that, we begin with that... Uh, I've, I've forgotten. Is her name Rose, that main character? She's very old at the beginning of the movie, and then everything's told in flashback. Uh, that's quite a common way of sort of... Um, you begin in the, in the present... Uh, but for the f rest of the story, you're in the past. Um, I do sort of feel like a lot of um, film critics and stuff will uh, criticize a, a movie for having an unnecessary book-ended flashback sequences. So you got to sort of think about, does this really bring something to the story? Um, but I think very often there there is this, as I said, the sort of beginning before the beginning. Um, sometimes you just have... You want to drop something on the reader that gives them a little foreshadowing of what this story is going to be like. Maybe we get a glimpse at the bad guy 
before we meet the good guy. Maybe uh, there's some seemingly disconnected scene that you're, you're, you're like deliberately let the reader feel like, what? Why are we even looking at this? Uh, and then later on, oh, okay, so that's what was happening during that first scene. It's sort of just, a, you know, it's an artistic choice that you can make. Your beginning can be preceded by sort of an earlier thing. Um, and uh, it's something worth considering. And now for number eight. If your goal is to grab the reader from the very first page, you can start at a peak of drama, then slow things down later on for the real beginning. And uh, definitely I have a good example of this in the form of Mickey Falls. Give me just a second here. Mickey Falls, uh, my series of four different books. The very first page, she's crashing through a window. I definitely uh, chose to do this uh, mainly to grab the attention of the reader and pull them in because the story begins quite quietly and uh, I thought well boy I don't want to risk losing someone on the first couple of pages let's grab them with something super dramatic so I basically found the very most dramatic part of the story uh, began with that and then sort of uh, did as I was saying this sort of um, you know, flashback and you tell the whole rest of the story not the whole rest of the story but quite a lot of the rest of the story in flashback. It's uh, worth considering, especially like I said, if that's if your goal is to grab them right from the start. Um, but uh, you know, that's not. It's uh, I, having done that with Mickey Falls. I actually have not ever done it again, uh, and I would be hesitant to, to do it again because it it could become a kind of a crotch, you know, as my my method of. Uh, this always works <laughs> if, I, if I begin at the very most dramatic part of the story, and then I think you can get away with it uh, a few times. But you don't, definitely, it's not right for every single story uh, that you tell. Let's move on now to number nine. It can be helpful to know your ending before you write the beginning, but some writers just jump in and start writing, making everything up as they go. This method may result in big changes being needed in the second draft to incorporate ideas that came to you later in the writing process. Um, so uh, in my video about writing endings, I think I did mention about, you know, sometimes you write the ending first. You figure out your ending. You don't necessarily write it, but you figure out your ending before you write anything else in the story so that you don't paint yourself into a corner. Um, but then I also wanted to point out that that's certainly not true of all. Um, writers, some writers do indeed just start on page one, they start writing, they discover the story as they go, and um, as I suggested, I think it almost invariably means that they are um, having to uh, rewrite things or change things uh, in a second draft, because they didn't know where they were going, they just sort of uh, let it flow, and then, you know, spontaneity is a great thing, and so... Um, I just wanted to put in a word here for those of you who are like, boy, do I really have to plan and think about this stuff? You know, for some of you hearing me talk about all these things might be uh, like, wow, man, this is so analytical. And, you know, what happened to the fun of storytelling? Uh, so I just wanted to sort of reassure you um, that, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't necessarily have to take such a <laughs> planned out approach as I'm talking about here and figuring out and thinking everything through. Sometimes you just sit down and start writing. You know, that might be the, the best form for you. Uh, just be prepared that uh, you are going to get ideas later on uh, through the writing process that maybe need to be incorporated a little earlier uh, in the uh, writing process. And a lot of people swear by this, and for them, the, the second draft, that's when it's fun because they got all the working pieces in front of them. You know, they got all the, uh, everything they need to really tell the story for real this time. So... Uh, that's certainly a, uh, a valid approach. Let's move on now to number 10. If your instinct is to start things in a bold or surprising way, go for it. At the beginning of a story, readers are usually very open-minded and ready to go on your journey. Um, and I just wanted to include this because um, I do believe that um, in a lot of ways you have... You know, the, the, the readers or the viewers, if it's a movie, they are ready to go with you, you know, and you have a chance at the beginning to do almost anything you want to, so long as you do, you do it well, um, because they, they are open-minded at that stage. I think by contrast, when you get to the um, end of the story, 
uh, then they are maybe not so forgiving of, an, uh, of things not uh, ending the way they wanted it. Or they have a lot of expectations, let's put it that way. By the time you get to the end of a story, um, then you really uh, have the, the, the readers saying, okay, I need you to, to deliver this, this, and this. And I think I remember reading an essay by uh, the great uh, novelist E.M. Forster, who said, you know, it, it's, it's almost impossible to end a story well, he felt. You know, it's so much easier to begin a story. Uh, but the, ha, trying to tie up all those loose ends at the end of a story invariably feels uh, false. And it, for him, at least, he felt it was a, it was a real struggle uh, to end a story. Hang on a second. I will take just a quick break here so I can get my black colored uh, pencil, my trusty black Prismacolor, and continue working on this drawing. Okay, so let's get on to number 11 here. The story's first scene doesn't have to be the first thing you write. Some writers like to start with a scene in the middle, then come up with the beginning later on. Uh, this was the process that I used when writing my latest graphic novel, The Drawing Lesson. I wanted to sort of throw myself into the middle of the story uh, to familiarize myself uh, with um, what it was going to be like um, in terms of these lessons that are taught in the book. And so I jumped into chapter 5. This was actually the first uh, chapter that I worked out in rough form, and I proceeded to the end of this chapter and had chapter 5 completely written. Um, before going back and coming up with my beginning. Speaking of, uh, you know, lack of exposition, um, this book actually does begin with no exposition whatsoever. We see this kid uh, out in a park, and everything sort of um, proceeds in a visual way without um, any exposition at all. We're just sort of tossed into it. Uh, maybe this idea that he only has a dollar and 19 cents in his pocket. That's the closest we get to exposition here because uh, pretty soon we're into the the meat of the story where he uh, encounters the the teacher uh, or the woman that he's going to uh, turn into his teacher basically and uh, it goes from there. Uh, so it certainly is possible to begin a story with no exposition whatsoever. Um, all right, I think we're coming up to the uh, Last, oh, I was going to say about the, um, uh, you know, starting in the middle, I uh, almost got that idea um, from Brad Bird I, when I was watching to go back to Ratatouille. I, I remember him in his uh, DVD commentary um, about the movie saying that he likes to, you know, instead of trying to begin at the very beginning, he likes to start with a scene somewhere deeper into the story. Uh, and I thought, hey, that's a good idea. And it certainly worked, and I, I may try it again. Uh, for future stories that I write. Here we are, this is the last one, number 12. It's nice to have a great first sentence or an incredible opening shot, but neither of these is as important as having several solid opening scenes. Uh, I just wanted to get one final thing in here. I think sometimes people do confuse uh, the beginning of the story with the first sentence or the, the very opening moment, you know, that there's the beginning of your story. Well, technically, yes, that's the absolute beginning, but that's not the real storytelling. And um, I, I, I think that some people might get sort of fixated on, oh, I gotta have this dynamite first sentence. Uh, I have to say that that has never been a big concern of mine. Uh, I think this, you know, the story survives on whether it's a good story and, and, and a, an amazing first sentence is not going to save it if it's a lousy story. So um, if you come up with a great first sentence, fantastic, you know, but uh, don't feel like, oh boy, before I do anything else, I better sit down and come up with this brilliant <laughs> sentence that's as good as anything in the history of literature. I think you're going to freeze up if you uh, get bogged down with that kind of stuff. Well, as always, I like to finish the drawing before I finish the video, so I'm going to bring in old man time lapse. Oh, I sure do love Moana! And <laughs> he is going to help me finish up this drawing before we wind down this video. Uh -huh.
right, well, there's my video on story beginnings. I hope you found it helpful. I'm not going to pull out the books uh, like I usually do at the end of the video, just because I pulled them out several times throughout this video as examples. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean I am not grateful to each and every one of you who have supported me by getting those books. So let's go ahead, though, and wind this down by laying down the pencil. I want to thank you all for watching this video. I really hope you liked it. And I'll be back with another one real soon.